see how accurate that countdown was, right, Katie? Yeah. <laughs> but hi, everybody. We are live streaming. Mark Graben here joined by Katie Anderson. We are going to just do a little bit of a sound check for everybody and uh, a little informal chat before we start the formal podcast recording. How are you, Katie? I'm doing great. I'm excited to be here with you today, Mark, and to uh, be kicking off a week of celebrations. We'll talk about that in a minute when we do when we start our formal recording. We'd love to hear from people in the chat and it'd be a way to test if this is working. Let us know where you're located if you want to say hello in the chat. And we're also going to use that as a mechanism uh, for, for questions. I've got some questions I'm going to ask Katie, but as a live stream audience, you'll have the benefit here of being able to ask uh, submit questions yourself. And I, so I think there is a bit of a lag between when people put comments in and we when we see them, but yeah, we will. Oh, all right, here's our first hello from LinkedIn. Hello. Thank you for doing that. And uh, we will get started with formal podcast episode here in just right. one second. They're rolling in that's, now. <laughs> that's me, from Fort Myers, Florida, Canada. Mark DeJong, he just he has his own podcast. He interviewed me recently oh, yeah. and he's interviewed cool. others who we know. All right. So it looks like this is working. Cool. We've got some connections with people. So we'll go ahead and start the podcast formally here in a second. Hmm. All right. Hmm. Here we go. Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to this special live streamed and recorded episode of the Lean Blog Interviews podcast. I'm your host, Mark Graven. Um, this is episode 420 of the podcast. So you'll be able to find show notes, leanblog.org slash 420. So before I give a little bit more of an introduction to our guest, Katie Anderson. Katie, how are you today? I'm great, Mark, and I'm really excited to be here today. And I believe this is my sixth episode with you. So this is uh, exciting to continue our conversations. Yes, it is the sixth time uh, that, that you've been a guest. And I think you'll we'll be able to explore some topics and questions that we haven't um, covered mm -hmm. before. So I'll put a link in the show notes uh, if people want to go listen to those previous episodes, because the first time I interviewed you, you were actually at, at the time you were living in Japan. Do I remember right? I was. I think it was in the first six months of me living in Japan back in 2015, which now is starting to feel like a long time ago. And uh, <laughs> yeah, it continued my journey. And uh, it was sort of that time was the genesis of so much that we're going to talk about here today. So I'm looking forward on uh, looking back and looking ahead. Yeah. And so we can kind of trace Katie's journey a little bit through these different podcast episodes. Um, to tell you a little bit more about her, if you don't know Katie, she is a leadership and learning coach. She is a consultant. She's a speaker. She's an author. She has been a Japan study trip leader. And I know she is very much looking forward to being able to do that again in the future. Fingers crossed for those who are just listening. Um, she is the founder and principal consultant at her own firm. And one of the things we're celebrating today, um, it, she is, Katie is the author of the book titled Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn, Lessons from Toyota Leader Asao Yoshino on a Lifetime of Continuous Learning. And uh, tomorrow is the first anniversary of the book, right, Katie? Yes, I can't believe it's been a year already uh, that the book's been out and uh, it's a really exciting week here. Another thing that makes this uh, exciting, not just celebrating the, the first, is it a book's birthday or an anniversary? I'm not quite sure. I don't know, depend after <laughs> having someone, been someone who's given birth, I don't, maybe I, actually I would say maybe a book is, be, it's like birthing a, <laughs> birthing a book. So we could call it the, <laughs> the birthday or it's publication anniversary, uh, the launch, so. The yeah. launch, first anniversary of the launch. This week, tomorrow is the launch of, I'll just let you, Tell everyone, Katie. Of the, of the audiobook version. So last uh, July in 2020, we published the print version and the ebook version of uh, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. And I had so many requests for an audio version. So it was one of my top priorities for this year. And it's narrated by me with guest appearances by uh, Estelle Yoshino, who's the subject of my book, and John Shook, who read his foreword. And I'm really thrilled to be coordinating the release of the audiobook on the anniversary or birthday of, um, of the book's release. 
Well, congratulations on that milestone. And um, one other thing Katie is doing to celebrate the anniversary of the book, which is also available as a Kindle book, if you want to tell them real quick about the Kindle book sale. Oh, yes. Yeah. So in thank you, Mark, for uh, for in celebration of the anniversary of the book's release, we're running a three day Kindle sale. Uh, it'll be 99 cents or 99 pence in the US and UK um, Amazon market. So if you're looking to get your copy tomorrow, or I shouldn't say tomorrow, Wednesday, July tw uh, 14th, 15th and 16th of 2021, there'll be a 99 cents and pence uh, Kindle deal in your um, in your region. So I'm really excited to be able to do that. And I'll make sure there's a link to that in the show notes where people will be able to find that on Amazon. So we're gonna dive in some questions and we've got the opportunity for the audience to submit questions. Um, before I talk about that, it's just cool to scroll through. Mm. We've got people here from India, the UK, Serbia, Syracuse, New York, Louisiana, Pittsburgh, Ghana, Bangladesh, Croatia, Ontario, wow. Texas, my home state originally of Michigan, Saudi Arabia, Mexico City. Like this is this is pretty amazing that we get to reach. So many. So many people from so many countries and um, thank you for joining us here today. Um, I've got some questions I'm gonna kick things off with, but if you would like to submit a question for Katie, um, use the chat. I'm gonna do my best to help scroll through and manage this, but please clearly label if you're submitting a question, if you just put in all caps question to make it clear that, you know, cause sometimes people wanna just comment and that's great. Um, but if there is something that you're submitting as a question, please clearly label it and I'm more likely to be able to get to that question. It's part of the experiment of doing something uh, a little bit new. So Katie, first question for you, you know, you sent out uh, an email newsletter recently and you asked a question of, of your audience and your readers and your community. What does leadership mean to you? How would you, how do you, how do you answer that question? So, you know, leadership can mean many things, but what I've really come to believe is it, it boils down to three essential points. And this is uh, something I discovered through working with Mr. Yoshino and writing the book and learning so much about what leadership meant from his perspective over 40 years at Toyota, as well as my own experience working with leaders around the world in my, uh, my coaching and consulting practice, is that uh, leaders do three have three really essential roles or purposes. And the first is to set direction or provide clarity of purpose, of direction, of targets. The second is then help their people, so support people to achieve those goals or move towards the direction. And then the third is to develop themselves. And so if we do all those things like set a clear direction, develop and support people, and then develop ourselves as well, to me, that is the essence of leadership. We're helping people move towards a new um, challenge, a new destination, but we're also developing their capabilities at the same time and not forgetting that we need to develop our own capabilities in leadership and coaching and problem solving as well. So from those three things, are, are they equally difficult? Mm -hmm. Is one of those, do you think more difficult or does it depend on the person and their circumstances? I, I think it really depends. I, all of us have different challenges and different things that come more easily and things that come that are that are more challenging for us. And I'd say this when I talk about lean and continuous improvement in organizations, I'd say the same thing. You know, people say, oh, it's so easy for Toyota or it's so e it must be easier in Japan. And that's not actually you know, it's true that the, the sort of the principles and the, des, you know, the, you know, how to be a better leader, how to be a better learning organization, the things that challenge us depend on our own circumstances and abilities. So, you know, like, for example, for me, I'm an extrovert, and I found that it was harder for me to sit in silence and to not interrupt people, mm -hmm. and that I really wanted to hear what they had to say, but my own desire to contribute sometimes over, you know, overcame that. That might not be the same challenge for someone who might be, you know, a bit quieter or, you know, so everyone has different challenges, but how can we then learn to provide that clarity? What does it mean to really develop and support other people? And then what are the things that are our challenges and opportunities for ourselves uh, to learn and develop? Mm -hmm. Now, either from your time living in Japan and traveling to Japan with the study trips and all of the time that you've spent talking to Mr. Yoshino, do you think your answer to the question of, you know, what, what, what is leadership? Has, has that changed or evolved through 
through that influence? I mean, absolutely it evolves because we learn through our own experiences and what we're exposed to. And so, you know, if, if, you're, if our thinking doesn't evolve, then, then we're sort of stagnant. I would say it's, uh, it's nothing in the last maybe 10 years, anything that's dramatically new. It's just maybe a deeper appreciation for concepts and for practices and for what it really means to show up in these ways. And so, you know, I, my own challenges and, and opportunities to work with people. And I, so I've learned about myself and I've, I've really learned from Mr. Yoshino and his experiences too. So again, not, I think these, these leadership lessons are really timeless. Actually, one of the taglines I was thinking about a year and a half ago when I was working on the book was like timeless leadership lessons because they aren't anything new. However, when we see them from different angles and maybe hear different experiences, we can have a renewed appreciation for what it means in practice. And when we think about, so we use that word practice. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you use the word deliberate a lot so we can maybe, uh, or intentional actually mm -hmm. is the word you use more often, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, intentional practice, we can, we can combine mm -hmm. those words. Um, I, I like that word practice a lot. That's why I've titled one of the books that I collaborated with others on practicing lean. Yes. And leadership is something also, I just want to hear your thoughts on mm -hmm. the idea of maybe not just practicing lean, but practicing leading, practicing coaching, as you've been doing a lot of recently. What, what are some of the thoughts that come to mind? Um, thinking of this evolution that we go through, it's not yes, no. I haven't been trained, now I'm trained. Wasn't good at this, now I'm good at this. What, what are your thoughts on, on practicing? I love that word practice as well. You know, I think it's, I, I talk about how do we connect purpose, process, and practice. And it's through the practice that we then achieve higher levels of performance. Yet we're not always like, we're never really reaching that destination of perfection or the ultimate expert. We're just continuing to learn and evolve along the way. And so I think it's, it, it, when we think about it as practice, it really helps ground us that we're always learning and where there's always new things that we can do or the opportunities for improvement. And it's when we, when we sort of stop thinking that we have opportunities to improve that we really, I guess, lo lose that humility and lose that real connection for what it means to be a leader. So I, I love that word practice. And you mentioned the word intention and that's, you know, that really is my, my key word and what I consider to be my purpose, which is helping inspire people around the world to live and lead with intention. And to me, that's about understanding what's your purpose, what are your values, what's important about who you wanna be, and then how do you align your actions in that direction? Uh, because sometimes we have the intention internally of the impact we wanna have, but our actions that we take might not actually serve us in that direction. So mm -hmm. that's our opportunity for improvement is creating greater alignment between action and purpose to deliver the impact we want. And, and, and to me, you know, doing something with intention makes me think of our friend, you can call it the PDCA cycles mm -hmm. or the PDSA cycles. I like to say plan, do, study, adjust. And yeah. I think doing something with intention certainly involves some planning. Mm. And then some doing or some testing, but then being intentional about the study and adjust and making sure we're not just going and doing randomly uh, random things. We're not saying just uh, leaders go go coach and develop people like uh, whenever I don't know something will something will come up something will happen like we need to go create these opportunities as a leader right. Yes, and I, I I prefer calling the the scientific method plan do study adjust as well, and I'm actually advocating for <laughs> for us to reframe what where the where the acronym starts with study and adjust to emphasize how important the study and the learning component is. We sometimes get caught in these plan do plan do cycles because PD you know we we don't ever get to the S and the A the study and the adjust or the check and act. And I like to say that reflection is the beginning and not the end of learning. So we need to really deeply understand, study and reflect this concept in Japanese about hansei, which is self-reflection. And how do we bring that practice more deeply um, into what we do every day as individuals and then at the organizational level as well? Yeah. I mean, I see what you're saying about, you know, starting with study, because I think there, there would be a trap. I mean, there's the words and then there's the intent and how this is taught and, and coached 
um, as, as we all practice this. I think there, I can see where there's a trap where people say, oh, plan, I have a plan, let's plan to do something. Mm -hmm. well, well, wait a minute, you know, I think, you know, I was taught that, that the, the initial plan does involve, make sure you understand the current state. Yes. You could call that study. Yes. And, you know, I, th I think the intent or the mindset could well, right. be there. You, it's a, you know, it's a continuous cycle. So it's really where you, where you start. But I like SAPD because it really reminds us to start with studying and to not skip that step. Uh, however, as long as you're doing it continuously and, and studying and adjusting is part of your continuous improvement cycle for yourself and the organization, you know, it doesn't matter. But I, I'm an advocate for SAPD and want to start a movement. <laughs> And if people, I mean, there and and you know, there 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 are these different traps. I think to be to be careful about jumping to do, mm. um, planning and doing without studying and adjusting. Or you know, I think one reason um, you know some have shifted away from saying check or even W. Edwards Deming from earlier works. Mm. He would talk about plan, do, check, act, and then he started writing plan, do, study, act. Because I, I the one explanation I've heard of the danger of misinterpreting the word check is like, it's sort of a rote, mm. check the box, plan, do, check that you did it. I'm like, well, yeah. no, that, that that's not really what's meant. Right, well, and I've been talking to Mr. Yoshino about this as well, because at Toyota, when Deming was teaching them, it, he was in the using plan, do, check, act as the cycle. So that was what got embedded at Toyota and continued forward. And he and I've had some conversations recently about how the, con the word check can make it sometimes feel even punitive. Yeah, it's a check the box mm -hmm. or it's something, did you do it or did you not? And could have a, a judgment rather than I'm coming to learn and support and, uh, and and do that studying about what's working or what's not. So he's actually even shifting some of his, his language, but it is deeply ingrained. So in the book, we talk about PDCA. Although when I speak in my coaching and consulting, I talk about PDSA or SAPD. Yeah, and a lot of, explanations of PDSA. I've even seen, you know, from Toyota people, you get into the fine print, you know, by, by do, it talks about doing a test and a small yeah. test of change. The one proposal I've made is that uh, we could run risk of confusing it with parent teacher student association, but PTSA <laughs> yeah. of plan test study mm. adjust. I'm like, well, if we say do, but then we explain, well, do means test. I'm like, well, we could just, we could just say test. Yeah. Then we're getting, yes, yeah, <laughs> or, or experiment, P-E-S-A, <laughs> that's That all would work place. too. Yes. Yeah. Doesn't flow, doesn't flow quite as well off the tongue. But. Maybe, <laughs> or we, we, we would just have to practice saying it maybe. Yes, and again, we're using <laughs> English words, so it, you know, it could be even different, even different acronyms in different languages as well. Yeah. So I want to come back to you. You talk about these ongoing conversations that you had mm -hmm. with Mr. Yoshino and your collaboration and your friendship and, you know, the coaching and the mentoring that goes on in both directions. You know, so since the book has been published, yeah. since the book was written more than a year ago, you continue to have these conversations. I mean, what, what's something that stands out to you, something that you've learned from these ongoing discussions with Mr. Yoshino that maybe wasn't even yet captured in, 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 in the book. Yeah, so it was really interesting, you know, well, as we were writing the book and, and a lot of the stories that emerged and how, you know, I've written them in a linear way, but many of the experiences did, you know, it came out over years and, and really putting together the stories um, for those of you who have read or now listened to the book, the, the water ski boat um, decade, really what pieced together in new information was even coming out in my conversations with Mr. Yoshino, like a week before, <laughs> before we published. Well, and, and for those who don't know the whole story, when you say the water ski oh, decade, yeah. if you could so, explain yeah, so, that a little bit. Yeah, so a quick comment. So Mr. Yoshino's last, no, almost last decade of his time at Toyota. So at uh, the end of the 90s and into the early 2000s, he had an idea for a new business venture for uh, for Toyota. And it was a water ski boat, uh, a high-end Lexus engine water ski boat in the for the US market. And it ultimately was a huge failure uh, for a variety of reasons. And you can explore that in the book, but Mr. Yoshino always was very transparent about the fact that he had this big business failure that cost Toyota millions of dollars. Um, and that he personally felt a lot of responsibility for, but there, there weren't a lot of details around what that, what that was. And, and so it took us years and years to sort of unpeel and uncover. And actually one of the biggest, I guess gifts and joys for me that I was able to give Mr. Yoshino was a shift in his own thinking about what this, 
failure meant. And one day he had this more joyful expression on his face and talking about it. He said, I've seen seeing this from a new angle and you're helping me. Your questions are helping me see this experience, not always from a bad lens, but from a positive lens and the, and the, and the richness of the story. And so that's an example of things that were emerging. But there was a certain point I remember uh, sitting around like, OK, uh, Mr. Yoshino, you know, <laughs> if anything else comes out, we're just going to have to like write some articles or some blog posts <laughs> <laughs> because I can't, we got we got to we got to publish this this book. Uh, so things that have come out in the last year, I would say, are, are less of um, details around stories, more just continued um, reflections on what the principles and practices of leadership and leading a purposeful life have meant, particularly in a pandemic. You know, the most of this book was constructed pre-COVID. Uh, I would, I had written, I was, I was revising the book when, uh, when the pandemic really hit, and so, really reflecting for both of us on what does this mean for us? You know, li living in this new world. What did it mean to publish a book in a pandemic? And uh, you know, we had we had plans to be together multiple times across uh, three different continents last year in 2020. Of course, that didn't happen, but we've continued to collaborate virtually. Uh, Mr. Yoshino, just the other night, we were talking about he, uh, the concept of patience, and he was saying it was fun. He was finding it hard to be patient, and I reminded him of a quote of his from the book that he learned many years ago that being patient requires a lot of patience. And you know, I think that's really true. That sometimes, <laughs> sometimes it's hard wow. to it's hard it's hard to be patient, right? Uh, you know, he was he re only recently got his vaccine at the age of um, seventy seven um, in Japan. So this is in June, and you know, he's ready to see people. And as you know, thankfully, we we reflected on gratitude as well that he's remained healthy during uh, during this time. And I think the concept of challenge and uh, the the Japanese proverb fall down seven times, get up eight, has really mm -hmm. been true for all of us in different ways this last year. You know, things, we all had challenges. Some of us had bigger challenges than others um, and continuing, continuing to do so. How do we continue to get up and move forward and learn from those experiences? And um, even if there are challenging times, how can, you know, how do we move forward in life as well? So I think those are those have been some of the big reflections too, and and how can you still find the good in circumstances even when they're not so feeling so good um, at the time as well. Yeah, and we've got a question that came in, um, kind of related to this, you know, kind of ongoing continued learning. And one thing I just noticed here, it seems like the chat coming from LinkedIn into the restream platform um, somehow got disconnected. So if mm -hmm. I flip over to LinkedIn, I can actually see. Yeah some questions there. So Anne asks, um, and, and we can delve into the audiobook process a little mm, bit here because yeah. we do like talking about process with the uh, the new audiobook version. Did the audiobook process yield any further content to the print edition? Or maybe another way of asking that is, like, did you go off script and add some things or, or were you pretty much word for word just from the book? So yeah, the, so thank you. That was really actually, it was fun to do the reading of or the narration uh, of of the book. There were, a, I, I read it verbatim for the most part. The only thing that I did add at the end um, was more resources, which I did. I mentioned the workbook that I've created. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a companion guide, but that's really the only thing I went off script for. Um, even though there were some sentences as I was reading them, I'm like, oh, this, <laughs> this is a bit wordy and challenging to say. You know, there's some, some of those things that in writing seem fine. And then when you're trying to say them are more challenging, but I really, did um, for the most part, I, I mean, I hope I think it's probably ninety nine point nine percent verbatim reading. So yeah. there were some plan, do, study, adjust cycles. You're planning, you're reading, and yeah, writing to be read is different than writing mm. to be spoken um, in, sure. in a lot of different ways. I'm sure. For sure, and you know, I have a lot. I have some Japanese words throughout the book. And I studied Japanese when I was living in Japan and subsequently, but it's, I've gotten quite rusty over the last year and a half. Um, and there were some, there were some names and some words that were tongue twisters, or I wasn't quite sure if I was saying them accurately. So I, I would go back and keep reading them again. So, you know, there's these things where it's, you know, you read it in your brain and that's fine. Uh, and then you, when you're saying it, you you realize, oh, I, I'm not quite sure if I'm saying this, this right, but in the spirit of, um, 
good is be is better than perfect and not getting it out. Um, right. I hope people will uh, give grace if there's some some small mispronunciations here and there. Yeah. Well, so and you know, we, we, one other thing we could step back to, you know, and ask about the book process. There's the writing, but then you chose to publish the book, and then you created and published the audio book. I mean, I guess you always do have the ability. I'm not trying to put pressure on you, but maybe for the second anniversary, I mean, you, you, yeah, I mean, you can always go back and fix the typo oh. with print on demand, yes. or you can, you, you could do a revised edition at some point. You've got a lot yes. of uh, freedom and flexibility. That's one great thing about self-publishing. Yes. Yes. Well, uh, you know, you asked me earlier about like my greatest mistake or my, my recent mistake. So I did find some after we published the book and, and I'm so grateful for Karen Martin. She <laughs> she she's a great lean thinker and author who has come before me. And she she reassured me that there were going to be typos in the book, despite countless people. And like I, you know, we had hired editors and proofreaders and Mr. Yoshino and I were reading it multiple times. It still things snuck through. And so actually in the first uh, I guess even in the first few months, we went back and corrected a few um, a few rounds of some edits. So if you have a book that was published <laughs> in the first round, you got the, you ordered it in July of 2020. Uh, you have a few more typos in there, a limited edition, and we did go through all, and, and make some of those changes. Although I have to say, when I was reading the book for the audio book, I found a few small a few small edits or small yeah. typos, which will be made made as well. But you know, it's it's a good reminder of the fallacy of human inspection. I always think about mm -hmm. that. Like, how do we poke a yoke? How do we, how do we airproof? And yes. that despite many, many, many people reading uh, the book in before publication, it's, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, uh, you know, even with my book Measures of Success, which I published myself, there were, uh, I had a professional editor working with me. There are co there was a copy editor from a firm that did the book layout. There's even a subspecialty of proofreader, yes, which is uh, I guess you know a, a more specific role. And 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 still, like Karen was saying, right. and I would have coached you the same way. Even books published by large publishing houses. Yeah. Yes. I mean, uh, the first edition of Jeff Liker's amazing book, The Toyota Way, yeah. had a typo on page one. I forget what the typo I know, was. I know. I, so it, it all, all of that makes me uh, makes me feel better. But I, you know, I'm so grateful and glad that I I chose to establish my own publishing company and uh, retain, you know, the the decision making for for all of that. I had opportunities to go with some publishing houses, but I really wanted to retain um, the creative control. And it was an mm -hmm. exciting business um, venture for me too to learn something do around the world of publishing. So that's been that's been a fun journey and it, I've enjoyed it. Yeah, and you also maintain uh, business control when it comes mm. to pricing and, and other decisions that a publisher yeah. might end up making for you. Um, first edition of my first book, Lean Hospitals, also had a typo on page <laughs> one. So, I mean, like, yeah, I could understand like, you know, if proofreader gets fatigued by the time, you know, they've read 30 pages and maybe they haven't taken a break, but it yeah. just goes to show like, the brain and our eyes play tricks on us and For it's sure. really hard to inspect quality into any sort mm. of product or process. Yes. Uh, yeah, for sure. And I'm, I'm also excited now that to be seeing the book come out in other languages, although I will not have <laughs> the, the publishing control over that. So it's already out in Spanish, um, published oh, by the Lean Institute, Columbia. And then I'm just signing deals right now for it to be translated into Polish and Japanese. So I'm really thrilled about that. That is great. Um, so let's step back. You know, I'm curious because I've, I've never done an audio book. Um, what was some of the process that you mm. went through in terms of not just the technology involved, but the approach that you took to turn uh, the printed page into, um, yeah, and how many hours of, mm. prod I guess, first question, I'm asking too many questions all at once here. <laughs> Um, how many hours of listening is it and how many hours did it take to record that? Yeah, so I, I didn't not like record, you know, document sort of how specifically how many hours, but the, the final the final audio book is about eight hours of spoken time. And I would imagine it's about double that uh, because there were some sections I had to re-record. And then, you know, you if you're stumbling over a sentence, you just keep you keep 
saying it over and over again. So, but you know, you can't do all that in one sitting. So it was, it was over a period of like two weeks that I did the majority uh, of the recording. Mm -hmm. uh, but going back to one of your first questions, what was the process? Number one um, important step for me was hiring an excellent audiobook producer. Uh, and so, you know, as the, as the publisher and, and then narrator, I really, it was important to have um, a professional high quality producer who would then manage all of the sound quality, the editing, then the final construction of it. So I had a great partner, a great partner in that. And, you know, we didn't know where I was going to record. I, hopefully, I was hoping it would be able to be done in my home studio. So what we did is I had, uh, I got, well, I'm actually, it was recorded here on this microphone that I have, but I also got, I had a boom and I had a special, I don't even know what it's called, like a screen over it to help with reverberations. So we set that up and then we tried a few different uh, rooms with different configurations with like blinds pulled and with uh, different rugs and, and carpets. So the one that actually was the best was the, the room that I'm typically in in my office with the blinds pulled and uh, with with rug with a thick rug on the carpet, and so it worked. Uh, it worked fine. Although we discovered in one of the early recordings that the chair I was sitting in made a slight squeak, and so I, oh, <laughs> right. that was a, that was a uh, PDSA uh, SAPD opportunity. So <laughs> I had to re-record <laughs> some of that, and then we and then we uh, made some made some adjustments. So yeah, it was it was great. And then I asked John Shook if he would be willing to read his uh, let his foreword, which he did, which was great. And then we had Mr. Yoshino read his letter to the reader and then the introductory quotes to each of the key anchor chapters. So they you hear their voices throughout the book as well. Well, that's great. And one thing I hear you saying, and I think this applies both to printed books and or or Kindle books and um, audio books, there's, there's this balance of like, when you self publish, that doesn't mean do it all yourself. No, no. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just to emphasize that point for anyone who's thinking of, well, you know, I couldn't do that. And, and I think that's where self published can be just as professional as a, you know, full blown publishing house, because you've got access to talent that would otherwise be working sometimes as a subcontractor to you know, a big publishing house. So self-published certainly doesn't mean um, unprofessional anymore. No, and I, I think there's there's such a wide range. I mean, you could just upload a word document and you know and and truly self-publish it. Um, I wanted this book. I I founded a publishing company and I I'm a publisher and I hired a, mm -hmm. a a team across you know everything to to do that in the same way that a publishing house would have those people in house. And so um, yeah, absolutely that I think there's what, what's great is that you can retain more flexibility and control. And as you said, and I, I really value that. Um, one of the things for me, well, and also how to make a financial, upfront financial investment to be able to hire those people. But for me, knowing this book wasn't about the money, I really wanted to get the stories out and I wanted to tell it the way I wanted to tell it. So I'm really grateful for how, met, how many people have been excited by the book and reading it and, um, it's been wonderful. Yeah. I'll, I'll, so maybe I'll adjust my own language instead of saying self-published. It would also be accurate to say my company published the book. Yes. Well, Integrin <laughs> Press. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, so one other thing I wanted to ask you. Um, we talked earlier about practice, mm. and we talk about learning, and you know, you're often coaching people who are new at their practice of coaching others or doing things related to lean or other leadership activities. Is there something new that you've started mm. learning and practicing recently, even if it's something, let's say outside of a uh, workplace setting, just, you know, I think of the, the, the power, the benefit that comes from being a new learner and going through something is, is there something that you've gone through recently or in recent years? Well, <laughs> I'm laughing because it's just been this has been a, a tough year. I think for me, it's uh, like, you know, I'm, I'm a mom of two kids and um, it, like surviving through the pandemic with homeschooling while running my business and publishing books and, and all that. To me, that was that was a really new challenge for me. I have not necessarily taken on a lot of other new sort of hobbies <laughs> or activities, but for, sure. for uh, you know, but it's just, for me, it's really the opportunity to practice what I 
uh, teach and preach um, from a work perspective in the home as well, because I, you know, especially with my children and we had a lot more time together, you know, they usually are at school for part of the day. They're right now they're seven and 10. So they are, they're quite young and um, figuring out how to also stay present and grounded and balanced for myself and, uh, still, you know, all, all, all of these things that happen in a sort of chaotic business environment too, how did I do that across all spheres of my life? And so I would say this year has been a real opportunity to practice all of the leadership and coaching skills uh, that I bring forward in my professional life to also uh, manage across my, my personal life as well. So yeah, so there, 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 these are situations that that you and many other people were thrust into, as opposed to mm -hmm. choosing to take on some sort of new skill or hobby or practice. But I, I love the way how you 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 kind of point out, though, given those circumstances, you still had opportunities to, if you will, practice what you preach. Oh, absolutely. I think some of my I know that uh, some of my best opportunities for practice are in engaging with my family because, and, and so I, I do what I, what I, I should demonstrate to others or I advocate, which is taking an intention pause and like reminding myself, like, what's my role in this moment? How, how do I want to be? Who do I want to, how do I want to really want to be showing up? What impact do I want to have? And then are my, is how I'm behaving really in line with that? And it, it can help just slow down and like remind me like, yeah, actually right now I, I want to lean into being with my, kids and saying yes. And like, I can say no to work right now, or right now work's more important. Or, uh, you know, I was picking my son up from the airport. He spent um, a week with his grandparents uh, in the Midwest. And I found myself ask, starting to ask closed ended questions. Like you did, you do this camp, or did you do that at camp? And I had to remind myself, I want to hear what he has to say, ask open ended questions. So the very same thing that I teach all the time, you know, this shows how ingrained our habits are, right? I had to like reframe and say, okay, you know, and, and really work on those what and how questions. Um, and we had a more enriched conversation. So it's uh, opportunities for us all. Whoa, and somebody is calling me that no. And I, darn it, there, I shut down everything. And then FaceTime still is connected to my computer. <laughs> so sorry. Uh, <laughs> there there, now, we have, now we have my recent favorite mistake, Mark. Yeah. Well, so, yeah. So again, and, and it's okay, Katie, because you know, one of the themes of, you know, when you and Mr. Yoshino were on my favorite mistake, that podcast, and, and we talk about uh, mistakes. So one, one of the underlying themes of the podcast is we all make mistakes. Mm. And so here's an opportunity, like, what was I going to do? Get upset with you because your phone, <laughs> that wasn't even your phone. It was your, uh, your FaceTime making on a noise. These, these things happen. So uh, sorry for the listeners if that jolted anybody. But, yeah. but we all have recent mistakes. I mean, I, I clicked um, and, and there's a reason why, you know, we try to join things like this 15 minutes early be before going live, whether it's a webinar or, or this. Um, I had clicked the link to go into the Restream live studio. And I thought, where's Katie? And I started to reach for my phone. I was about to text Katie and say, hey, do you have the right link? And she had already texted me three minutes previous. So it says waiting for host. Well, it was completely my mistake. Like Katie had cl uh, clicked on the correct link that I had sent to her. I made the mistake of going into the general live studio instead of, I guess, the live studio for this scheduled event uh, was different. So, you know, these these things happen and you know, I'm, I'm not gonna repeat that mistake. I've learned from it. But with um, the FaceTime thing, I've completely disabled that through yeah. my computer and through my iPad because I don't, that to me, that's not a compelling feature. Like to me, that's an annoyance. It's not a bug because it's intentional, but I, I don't like that feature of, you know, all my devices making noise when a phone call is coming in. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you. I'll be uh, talking with you offline about how to disable <laughs> <laughs> this, this feature so we can uh, do some study adjust for, for next time. And as a, a, a diligent person and as a, a lean thinker who practices what she preaches, I, I, I know that that noise, that sound won't interrupt any future live streams or webinars. No. Or anything, well, I even anything like that. No, I shut everything else down too. I just hate how it's all, you can't act like it was shut down, but it it's still created an automatic. Anyway, we will, we'll, we'll, we'll move back. We'll move on. From, uh, from I, I think we've, we've contained, well, actually, so when you talk about problem solving and quote unquote containment, um, did you click the do not disturb within the Mac? That might be a short term containment. 
Oh, in I, case somebody else calls you. Well, I'll I'll get the I'll get the I'll get the tutorial from you once we're done. <laughs> when okay. We're done with this. All right. Um, so we're gonna, we're going to move forward a little bit. I want to kind of explore a couple of questions. So in episode four nineteen with Allison Greco. Um, sort of had this idea that came to me for uh, a segment. I don't know if we'll do this every episode, but we'll we'll go through it today. I call the segment uh, "Best Thing, Worst Thing," where we explore on on some topic or theme, or we've got a couple here. What's the best thing about such and such, and what's the worst thing about such and such? Um, so, Katie, we've talked about uh, writing and publishing uh, a book um, on your uh, through your own publishing company. Uh, first off, what's the best thing about writing and publishing a book? The best thing for me, in, in my perspective, is the opportunity to learn and reflect really deeply uh, on a topic. And uh, to I'm, I'm quiet because like it's a it's a it's a big learning mm -hmm. experience. Uh, but to write a book requires, you know, this is 80,000 words, requires a lot of processing and reflection and uh, being willing to throw out things you've written and to actually, you know, someone's warned me that you'd write the book twice, you know, the first version <laughs> and the second. And when that's, that was totally true, uh, sadly, but it was, it was true. The, the, I feel like I learned so much more deeply with having to put create a perspective, figure out a way to weave a compelling, you know, narrative. Um, and so I've, I've learned so much. And so to me, that's the best, that that's the best thing. Well, I guess twofold, like the, the opportunity for learning for myself and then to have that be something that others can learn from and value as well. Yeah. I mean, I, I, the thought in my head was a similar thing about all of the learning that takes place. Like you feel like, you know, enough about a topic to write a book. And I've heard others say the best way to learn about some topic more deeply is to, to, to write a book because you, you like, you know, let's say with my book measures of success and the process behavior chart methodology, I, I knew it. I thought well enough to teach it and to write, but then I dug deeper. Mm. And I learned more and then I learned more about how to teach it, like, you know, mm. getting feedback from early readers. And so I, I don't know if this was your worst thing, but the, this idea of having to go reread what you've written and throwing or putting stuff aside because you think like, well, that's good, but it doesn't fit the flow mm. and maybe it doesn't fit anywhere. Was, was that editing or self, you know, th that evaluation yeah. or self-criticism the worst thing or was it something else? You know, for me, it's hard to say the worst thing. I think it's just part of the process. Um, was feeling stuck uh, at, at the sort of that juncture. I had a I had a vision for how I was going to structure the book originally when we started. We started with interviews, and then I was like, okay, well, we're going to write. It was going to be based on different leadership topics. I, I I write about this at the beginning of the book. You know, so each chapter would be like a leadership topic. And, I, and then I was starting to write and then I was getting really stuck at being able to stories and experiences don't fit neatly under like one <laughs> sort of one lesson. If you, you know, it's a small vignette, perhaps. Uh, and then in figuring out how to write that way. And I so I was trained as an academic writer. I my the, my first career was as a researcher, an academic researcher. I wrote um, academic papers published that way you know, have a master's thesis. And so I also had to unlearn some of my more formal writing, writing my mm. blog and articles that way. I feel like I had found my narrative voice, but I really had to lean into that um, as as well. But yes, I think the worst part was the, gosh, at the, at the very end, the tedious editing um, and just reading and rereading. I remember just last June in you know 2020, just reading manuscript after manuscript of like your your eyes start to glaze over uh, because the creativity sort of is lost at that point. But I I, really, I think there were I guess the two hardest things for me was coming across that barrier. But when I released and found the narrative structure between the using the concept of the metaphor of the weaving of the warp and the weft, the known and the discovered and then really leaning into the narrative as a chronological narrative rather than leadership stories. And then just the tedious worst part was the, you know, was the proofreading and final editing, which as we've already discussed today, still um, resulted in, you know, in small errors making their way through, but that's yeah. just the nature of it. 
Yeah. One of the other worst things is discovering, like when, once you thought those initial publication typos and defects have been caught, and then three months later, somebody points out another one. Or, <laughs> like, oh, narrating, no. or narrating your own <laughs> book and you're reading it, <laughs> there'd be a few points I'd be like, oh shoot. And then I would pause the recording and highlight. So yes, yeah. opportunities abound. Yes. And so the worst thing, and, and this is where I you know, figure out this framework, best thing, worst thing. Worst thing isn't always horrible. No. But it's um, and all things considered worst of some really good things that are happening. Yeah. Well, it's like we, you know, reframe failure. Failure is not failure if you can still learn from it. So, mm -hmm. uh, but you can still have a failure, uh, but it doesn't have to be the worst thing ever in the world. So it's a framing. Sure. Yes. And All right. Calling that other, calling that other podcast, my favorite learning opportunity doesn't have yeah. quite. The no, same. no, no. It's, it's fine. All learning. right. So hit me with the next best thing, worst thing. All right. So best thing, worst thing about working in healthcare improvement. Mm -hmm. When you were doing that, you, you have experiences that I haven't had where you actually worked full-time within healthcare organizations. Best thing, worst thing about working in healthcare. Yeah, gr great. So uh, well, after my career in academia, which was all based in uh, public health, by the way. So I moved into working in hospitals and healthcare systems and worked internally for almost a decade doing continuous improvement in healthcare. So my, I would say the best thing is it, it is so easy to rally around the mission mm -hmm. and um, it, the, people are passionate about really doing good for patients and the, the it's inspiring mission-driven work. And that is absolutely the best thing. You feel like you're making a real impact um, on important, tangible things for people. And I worked at a children's hospital for six years. And so you really feel that, feel that as well. So absolutely the best thing and uh, of that. Is there a worse thing that comes to mind? You know, I think there, when, when I was reflecting on what was the worst thing, I was I had this vivid memory of me sitting with uh, in the office at, with the perioperative business manager when I was working, looking at the perioperative services and doing a whole you know, multi-year improvement effort and some value stream work uh, in in perioperative services, and I was we were trying to figure out or I was trying to discover like what was the price <laughs> of different you know pieces of um, equipment and material and supplies. And it was like, there is no price. Like, do you mean the price that we set or the price that, or that we pay or the price that we charge by different insurers or the, and like the, the complexity that our, the insurance and payment system creates in healthcare to me is the worst, um, because it, obscures, obsc uh, I'm going to get a tongue twist, but you know, we can't, there's no clarity on what things cost, what value is. How, and, and so there is no sense of like, should, it makes it very hard. Um, and there isn't a lot of equity as well around that. And so uh, I think that that is one of the most challenging and worst aspects of the healthcare um, system and trying to do improvement in healthcare. We could do a whole series with different guests from different countries. Best thing, worst thing about your country's healthcare system, mm -hmm. because that would bring out, uh, there's, there's always something yeah. that's a, a best thing and a worst thing, U.S. Uh, included. All right. So uh, one other best thing, worst thing about being active on LinkedIn. Oh, that's uh, good. So the, the best thing is the community that's developed. And I love just connecting with so many people around the world and being able to share ideas. And I learn so much. Uh, you know, some people who I know who have like only recently joined LinkedIn, they like, thought, oh, it's just for if you're looking for, you know, a new job, but realize it's actually this amazing community um, for thought leadership, thought partnership um, and learning together. And so to me, that's the best thing about being active on LinkedIn and the community it's developed. Is there a worst thing? Well, I think it's the same as worst thing across any social media platform is that um, not everyone leads with kindness um, and that um, some people's intention is to put people down or to be mean or to call out. And I, I'm not saying that we can't um, disagree or have different perspectives. I think that's actually really important, but how do you do that in a respectful way um, with good intent and align your actions with that? And so I think there are some people who perhaps, um, or I know not just perhaps who, who don't do that. And so I think that's a negative across all social media. 
there are yeah there there are ways to disagree kindly and one one thing i think is the worst thing of social media is when uh people end up taking the stance that says basically nobody else understands this but me I'm like that's not a good look whether that's being said directly or even sometimes being implied yeah well that shows a lot about who they are as well so yeah yeah <laughs> So these things happen sometimes on social media, but mm -hmm. um, moving on to one, I'm going to throw one other one at you that I, okay. I didn't give you a heads up on advance. What was the best thing, worst thing about living in Japan full time as an oh. American? Oh my gosh, the best thing. There is so many best things. <laughs> there is uh, <laughs> there. I mean, I I really I love I love Japan. It's been really sad for me. Well, I've sad for all of us across <laughs> the pandemic. I, I, but I really miss being there, the food, the culture, all that. The unexpected best thing though, was the riding an electric bicycle called the Mamachari around Tokyo as my main form of transportation. I was not expecting yeah. that to be part of my experience. And it was delight. I'm a big cyclist and it was delightful to be able to really accessed the city um, on electric bike and had you know a seat in the front and seat in the back for my young children who were one and four at the time. And it was just, it was so much fun. And it, when, we, when we returned to the United States, I actually really did not, the one thing I, where, one thing I was really not looking forward to is like driving in my car just a mile to go somewhere. And we actually bought a different type of electric bike that was more California suited with a big cargo on the back that my kids could hop in. And I still mm -hmm. ride it to this day and I, I love it, so. Yeah. Electric bicycle commuting in Tokyo was my unexpected best thing about living in Japan. And was there a worst thing? Like I'm thinking, I'm not telling you what you're, I, I'm thinking of a, a gelato story. I don't know if that's the one that comes to mind for you oh, or what's your I, worst. <laughs> I, would, I, would, I can tell that story. I wouldn't call that the worst, uh, the worst thing. Um, oh, I mean, they're, they're all these like small, small, um, small little things. Gosh, I don't even know what I would consider the worst thing, but I'll tell the gelato story. I mean, I think there was, okay. I think it's more just like challenges in, you know, it, with with any situation. I've lived in many other countries. You know, I, I got my master's degree overseas and um, lived in a few other countries as an exchange student and uh, and working. But this just, you know, your different expectations from a cultural perspective. And I think it was like our first month in, uh, in Japan, I went to go to a gelato store and I wanted to take the, the flavors to go. Uh, but if you had two, two flavors in the same cup, you could not get a lid. You can only get a lid if you had one flavor. And they actually, yeah, I have this on my blog. I have the pictures, yeah. but you know, it, they had, even had a little, you know, visual symbol that had a picture of two different flavors, no lid. <laughs> and um, So I think it would be those learning to navigate the differences in cultural expectations. And, you know, we as Americans are used to a lot of customizing. Oh, you and I have talked about this on a past podcast. Like, we're, okay. we're used to a lot of customization and that that we equate with sort of customer service. Well, in Japan, they have like wonderful customer service. They treat you so respectfully and so nicely, but it's mm -hmm. really not customized. <laughs> you get what you yeah. get and how they've defined it. And so it's just, and it's very consistent that way, whereas American service is very inconsistent, but highly customizable. So it's just that, um, I wouldn't call that the worst thing though, because that's just a natural um, living apart. I'll have to come back with you on that one. <laughs> okay. Maybe we'll record uh, some bonus content sometime. I will. We'll make sure there's a link to Katie's blog post about the gelato. You can yeah. see the pictures there. We'll put that in the show notes. So um, before we wrap up, and uh, again, our guest has been Katie Anderson. First birthday anniversary tomorrow of her Yay. book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. There's also a companion workbook available, and the new audio book is going to be released. Yes. Tomorrow. Um, how can people, where can they buy the audio book if they want to do that? So if you can go to the book's website, it has links to everything, which is learning to lead, leading to learn.com. Uh, you also, uh, the book in print and ebook and audio is all available um, through links on Amazon in your country, as well as if you go to Audible and iTunes, it's available as well. And again, remember the Kindle sale will be happening if you're listening. Uh, right when this is published, July 14th, 15th, and 16th of 2021. So, and you can also find more information at my website, which is kbjanderson.com. So yeah, I'm excited. And tomorrow, for those of you who follow me, I'll be filling in the eye of this little Daruma, which was for the audiobook uh, release. 
So I'm excited for fulfilling, for completing another goal. For those who are just listening, that's a very shiny, if not blingy, gold, reflective Daruma, right? It, it is. And so it actually is, was originally silver. It's starting to look a little gilded. Uh, but I got this in a, at a when I first was starting my Daruma collection in 2015. And I bought this little guy at a bookstore uh, in Roppongi near my uh, where I was living at, and a really great Starbucks there. I hope it's still there. And yeah. Yeah, so I was wait. I was he was waiting for a good goal, and so uh, I assigned the audiobook release to him. So yeah, this is the shiniest Daruma in all my collection. <laughs> cool. Um, we do have a question that came in from the audience from Nikki. Great. Um, she says, uh, "My son started studies on Japanese language and culture, and plans on studying abroad in two years. What can you say about um, school academic standards?" Um, Going to be studying marketing and business administration. I know your your exposure was at, at uh, lower lower grades of education. I don't know if you have any thoughts on yeah. the education system or where Nikki might find some resources and information. Yeah, I'm I'm sorry, Nikki. I don't. I'm not really the best place to answer that question. Um, I don't really have any experience with the higher education um, system in Japan, but I know there are some great resources out there. Um, but really excited that he's going to be studying in Japan. I know he's going to have an amazing experience. You should definitely go visit. <laughs> well, look forward to um, borders and travel being uh, yes. reopened. I know, I know I am very much looking forward to getting back to Japan at some point. I know they're going through yet another mm. wave of, yes. um, of COVID. And I, we think the Summer Olympics, at, at this recording, the Summer Olympics are still going on yeah. but with a lot of restrictions and cautions in place. So we, yeah. uh, I know we both... Yeah. Uh, want the best for Japan and, and others around the world who are still struggling with COVID. Yes, for sure. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that next year I can lead my Japan study trips again in May and October. I have, I have some new dates, but again, we have to see how the, the pandemic evolves in um, global health. So top priority. And we'll, we'll, we'll eventually see each other in person and be able to travel again. Yeah. So one other thing I wanted to ask you about Katie, um, you have the opportunity through Zoom and other platforms to do a lot of coaching. You've been doing this during the pandemic, and I think some of that was even going on beforehand. Um, can you talk about some of the different um, coaching uh, approaches? I know you and Karen Ross have collaborated on what mm -hmm. you call the it's the the, the K two C two. Yes, coaching. the Katie and Is Karen. Right? Yeah, Katie and Karen's or Karen and Katie's coaching communities which uh, we haven't done for about five, about six months, but Karen's been working on her new book. And so we're going to, we'll, we'll start up again uh, soon with that. Yeah, no, it's been great. Karen and I started those coaching communities even before the pandemic. It was a really great uh, experience to be doing, and I, I'd done remote coaching as well, but to really um, be developing communities remotely, I felt like we were able to really um, do so much more last year and supporting people and even, uh, about how to how to move through the pandemic and how to also learn how to do remote coaching and uh, facilitation. And I've had some of my own um, programs as well. What I've you know built around the book called the um, Leading to Learn Accelerator, which is bringing in the concepts of the book and my own coaching practices and more. So it's been, uh, but we all have to. I definitely had to learn and pivot. I remember the very first time I did like a work a full like a four hour workshop on <laughs> online. I was like realized. Uh, I mean, I need to do some things slightly differently. So it's I, it's been a good learning. Oh, maybe that was the thing I learned new this year was how to really how to facilitate mm. um, more effective remote learning experiences. How do you take an, an in-person experience, still have experiential elements and really make that in a positive way um, for people to learn from everyone's you know home office or wherever they're located. And then you've got something else called the Learning to Lead Accelerator. Can you tell the audience a little bit about that? Hey, yeah, and I'm excited. I, I, I led this in uh, for individuals to join the program uh, in February and March of this last year. And I'll be offering it again later this fall. And I've actually been bringing it in-house in to a few organizations where it's a 
combination of taking the stories from learning to lead, leading to learn, and then also going through a journey of applying the practices and principles in their own lives, bringing in elements of what I coach and teach um, in, my, um, in my coaching practices with organizations and individuals. And so really deepening their experience and they, they use the workbook as well in that. And that's been, that was great. We had leaders from 20 countries or no, 20 leaders from like 10 different countries in it. And so mm. it was really exciting. Um, and I'm I'm doing some PDCA right now, PDSA on it, and looking forward to launching it again this fall. So if you're interested, reach out to me and let me know, um, and I can send you some more information when we have that ready. All right. Well, great. And the book website again is learning to lead, leading to learn .com, Correct. Yes, just the same name as the book, learning to lead, leading to learn .com, and my website is kbjanderson.com. And you can also, of course, reach out to me on LinkedIn and Twitter, and now I have my YouTube channel too, so um, lots of good stuff. Yeah, I hope everyone will go check it out. Congratulations again on the birthday versary. I'm going to call it that now. Yes. The birthday versary of the book, Learning to Lead, Leading to Learn. Congratulations on the launch the production and the release tomorrow of the audiobook. I hope that goes really well. I hope people will check that out. If they've been listening uh, to the podcast, you can get more of Katie mm. directly into your ears in audiobook format. A little bit from John Shook as well, a little bit from Asal Yoshino as well. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mark. It's always a pleasure and honor to talk with you. And I appreciate all the support you've provided to me as well as uh, an author and publisher and uh, and more in a friend. So thank you. Well, thank you, Katie. Congratulations on everything. Thank you for doing the high wire act. That is a live stream today. I appreciate you doing yeah. that and being a guest yet again. So fun. Great. Thanks, Mark. And thanks everyone. Mm -hmm. I look forward to connecting. Well, thank you everybody uh, for watching or uh, for listening. You can find show notes for today's episode at leanblog.org slash four two zero. Um, if uh, you, it's your first time listening to the podcast, please do follow or subscribe in your favorite podcast app. And if you like the episode, please rate or review the podcast. Please share the episode with a friend or a colleague. So thanks again. We'll see you next time.